things that we're actually holding on to are the things that God's really asking us to let go. And when we can actually give him and put our hands like this and give him everything that we already have in the full knowledge that's already his anyway, and know that God is in control and allow him full control and access of our lives, that's when God does the impossible in our lives. Well, I can tell you from personal experience that it is not an easy call in life to be a pastor's wife. But when you combine that with motherhood, being an author, a literary agent, a speaker, and a writing coach, well, the demands can become enormous. And my friend Michelle Lazurek found herself in that hard place. And Michelle had to learn the value that surrender would bring to her life. I'm your host, Carol McLeod. Welcome to this week's podcast of Significant Women. Significant Women is a podcast for women to gather with their personal stories and wisdom gleaned from the ordinary days of an uncommon life. Our goal is to simply encourage women that your story matters. It matters very much. Well, before we jump into my conversation with Michelle, let me tell you just a little bit about her. Michelle Lazurek is a multi-genre award-winning author. She's a speaker, a pastor's wife, and mother. I'm tired already, aren't you? She is also a regular contributor for iBelieve.com and Crosswalk.com and is a literary agent for Worldwise Media Services and a certified writing coach. Wow, my friend Michelle does it all. Michelle's new book is titled, I Surrender All, Sort Of, and we'll be talking about that today in my sweet conversation with Michelle Lazurek. Hi, Michelle. How are you doing today? Thanks for joining me on the Significant Women podcast. Hi, Carol. So glad to be here. Yeah, we've known each other for several years now. We have. Um, did we first meet at a writer's conference? Like, let's try to remember, how did we first meet? That's a, good, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> I don't know if we actually met at a writer's conference. I'm sure we've been at the same ones, but I don't think we kind of ran in the same circle. Okay. Um, but I think I got your name simply because we lived kind of sort of near each other a few years ago. And um, uh, so I invited you. I was a pastor's wife at a church about four hours from where I am right now and invited you to come speak. And I just want to say to anyone listening, Carol is one of the best speakers I've ever heard on any topic ever. So oh, if you are interested in having someone come for a tea or a women's event or whatever you're having on your plate for this year, please consider inviting Carol because she's one of the sweetest ladies I know, uh, has a terrific testimony, and uh, I just know her heart and love just how much she wants to glorify God through everything she does. So, And that's very, very true of her. So. Oh, thank you, Michelle. That was so sweet of you to say. I had no idea you were going to go there, but thank you. That that was heartfelt and encouraging. So, Michelle, tell us about you. Like, what does your life look like? Do you have cats? Do you have dogs? Do you drink coffee? Do you love the cold weather? Like, just tell us a little bit about the woman that you are. Yeah, absolutely. So, I I love what I do. Um, I hate to start off by saying starting off with something that I do because that's not who, how I'm defined. But I do love I do love it. Um, been an author for 13 years. Um, I've written, uh, this would be book 14 and 15 coming out this year. And um, I love it. I am also a literary agent and I got hired by my agent a couple of years ago. So I love being a part of uh, whatever God is doing, whether that's uh, helping someone, you know, with their concept. They don't know how to get started, but they have a dream. Okay, I want to write this book. They don't know how to get started. I love being on the journey with them there. I love being on the journey when they have a really good idea, but they need to polish their manuscript. And then I also love being there when I have to hit send um, to send it off to publishers to see if it's a match. So um, I also do some writing uh, co coaching for people. And so um, I love that when I'm not doing those things, which takes up more time than you would think. Um, I love Starbucks lattes. Um, I, fun fact, I correct, I collect eighties records and memorabilia. Uh, so I have collected many of the toys that I had when I was a kid and I have them on display in my basement downstairs and I will maybe confirm or deny that I have over 700 records. So I may have a slight problem, but, uh, I love music. I think vinyl is pretty much the only way to listen to music. So I love the, I love the popping sound of vinyl. I just think there's a unique uh, sound to it. And, uh, I love collecting it. And, um, 
yeah, so I love collecting that thing. I love taking walks with my husband. I have a dog, crazy dog named Cookie, uh, who will be six in April, and we just love her. She's a Bernice Mountain dog, and she's so lovable. And um, I just love spending time with my family. Oh, and I, I have never turned down a, a yard sale. <laughs> so if you've got a yard sale coming up it, within That's six right. hours, I will turn the car. Yeah, I will it. turn the car around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so who's your favorite artist from the 80s? If you collect vinyl from the 80s, yes. who's your favorite artist oh, or your favorite Lord. song? Okay, so my favorite song of all time, Secular Christian, is an 80s song called In Your Eyes by Peter Gabriel. Um, I think Peter Gabriel and Genesis and Phil Collins, that whole era, I think is was very much ahead of his time and what they created. And uh, I love In the Air Tonight. I think it's a very unique song. And if you've listened to anything, um, if you Google... Uh, Phil Collins and his last, I think it's Not Dead Yet tour, something that he did, his last one. His voice is the same as it was 20, 25 years ago. Um, it's so crisp and so clean, and both of them just put on such a show. So um, I love that, and I love 80s movies, and uh, there's been some classics that have come out that I feel like have withstood the test of time, and I, I watch them now, and they're still just as relevant now as they were 40 years ago. So um, so yeah, it was just a really good time to grow up, because that's the age that I grew up, so yeah, uh, I think it was probably the time right before. I remember distinctly eighth grade, getting in line, walking to class in my elementary school and seeing these big, gigantic screens coming through my classroom. And they were all being set up on these desks called computers. And uh, and we were going to have computer class for the first time. And we didn't know what that was. And my mom had one at home. She loved it. She used to uh, type on it, play video games on it. And uh, you know, now they were coming in our school and we just thought, oh, okay, this is great. It's a lovely little toy that we're going to play with. And little did we know that our lives will never be the same. So I never I'm talking to you on one. So, I know. <laughs> so to see how technology has advanced, <laughs> how crazy it is. But yeah, you know, and I, I said to myself a bunch of times during COVID, I said, you know, of course this, it was, it's tough to live through a, a, a lockdown. I mean, we're all going to agree on that, but um, could you imagine if we had to live through that in the eighties and nineties? where there were no, there was no Zoom. There was no talking to someone on a screen. There was, it, we're lucky if you had a beeper. Like you're lucky if you could spell out hello in numbers. Like that's, that was the extent of what we knew at the time, you know? And we just have so much technology now. We literally don't even have to leave our homes if we don't want to. And, uh, you know, and so we have still had access to some of the the luxuries that we never would have had in the 80s and 90s if we had lived through that. So I am incredibly grateful to God that he, if we were going to go through that, chose to give us some technological advances that will help us get through that, this tough time. So it is that. so true. And for people like you and I, who are communicators, even though our lives look different, we could continue to communicate. We could Absolutely. continue to reach people yeah. through the internet, through Zoom. Okay. Back to the eighties, Michelle. Okay. So my favorite <laughs> 80s song Whitney Houston, The Greatest Love of All. Oh, like, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Gosh, so, yeah. right. So what was your favorite 80s movie? 80s movie. Okay. Um, I hope you're not going to get mad. The Breakfast Club. I <laughs> I know it's a rated R movie, but it's if you go back and watch it, minus the language, you will uh -huh. see that that is representative of every high school class. Uh, from the 80s, 70s, 80s till now, we still have the the categories we put people in. And there's that iconic scene where they're all sitting uh, in the library. Um, at first they came in, they didn't know each other. They all, you know, called each other names and things. And you find out the backstories of these kids. And like the one that's the biggest, you know, jerk that gets the 10 detentions, he's being abused at home. And the girl that's the rich girl, you know, really is alone. And the kid that's the brainiac. The, the irony the irony of that scene is that the kid that you think is so perfect that's there to study is the one that had the actual offense to actually weren't being in detention on that Saturday morning and he actually had brought a gun to school and was gonna wow. he was gonna kill himself because he didn't wow. get uh, an A in shock class and wow. how how I, indicative is that of how many teens are dealing with that today and I just look at that scene every time and think. Gosh, they just, he just, John Hughes just nailed every teenager's struggle, weakness, wanting to belong, wanting to uh, belong to a group, belong to something. And at the end, they all just kind of leave and they say, and the, the song that's played is Don't You Forget About Me by uh, Simple Minds. And it's about not forgetting about 
this bond that we had on this iconic Saturday morning, which they're never going to have come Monday morning. Yeah. So I just love the, uh, they all just do a, such a fantastic job, but it's basically you got the nerd and you have the, the outcast and you have the, the jock and the, the everything. So it's everything that the kids go through today. Um, so iconic. And he just nailed the beauty of, and the struggle of what it's like to be a teenager. Love it. Love it. Well, so my favorite 80s movie. Are you ready for this? Okay. Hoosiers. Oh, okay. I I would have pegged you for a Chariots of Fire person. Okay. I did like Chariots of Fire. Yep. <laughs> okay. you're, you're right about that. But. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hoosiers is great too. Oh, yeah. My, my husband loves that movie. All right. Well, now that we've had our 80s fix and we've solved the problems of the young people today. We could talk about this all hour. I wouldn't mind. We could. We, we need to have another interview where we That's right. do that. So fun. But I love it, Michelle. And I love that we went there because now people know your heart. They know what a yeah. fun person you are and how yeah. eclectic you are and um, how different things interest you. And isn't that the story of all of us? Absolutely. We all have our little roads we go down. Um, yeah. So I love it. So now I want to know what your purpose in life is. Like as you look back at the years of your life and the lessons you've learned, maybe some of the hard things you've gone through, Michelle, some people might call it your testimony, but honestly, what has your story looked like and what have you learned? Share that with us. Yeah. So that's, that's a loaded question. So, um, what is my, my life purpose. Um, I think, why well, I think I want to know, I know what I want to be known for. Like I, okay. um, you know, I've had many people in church come up to me, have such a nice smile. You know, I go on the worship team and I sing nice, nice voice. God's blessed me with that. But that's not when I want people to stand up at my funeral and say, like I always mm-hmm. think about what would, if I was there to see what people would say about me at my funeral, what would I want them to say? That's good. And I think about, I want them to say that I made a difference in their life. I want them to say that they were better people for knowing me. And I want them to know, I want them to say that I challenged them in a way that made them better Christians. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the biggest compliment. If someone said, she told me the hard things and that changed my life. That for me would be a biggest compliment. Um, I, in one of the first churches we ever pastored about 20, 22 years ago, I had a friend and I had been meeting with her. She was in part of our church and she had confessed something to me that um, she hadn't told anyone. And uh, it was big enough where I wanted to encourage her to, to tell her spouse. And she didn't want to because it involved him and she was unsure of how he would take it. Would he judge her? You know, would they, would the relationship end? What would, you know, what would happen? And we went back and forth. No, I'm not going to tell him. I really think you should. And uh, you really are going to be better. And she did. She wound up telling him and it was rough. But their marriage was better because of it. And uh, their lives together were better because she wasn't withholding anything from him anymore. And 10 years later after that, she wrote me a letter thanking me for encouraging her to take that step. And she said no one had ever encouraged her in that way before. And she said that really changed my life. And she said, I can't thank you enough for making my marriage better because of your encouragement and how hard she knew that was for me to tell her that. And I think that's what I want people to remember me for. Um, I'm certainly not the most gifted writer. Um, there's thousands of people who can write better than me, uh, better singers than me, better literary agents, better anything better than me. Um, but I think what I bring to the table, uh, when I think about my writing and what I bring my message out into the world is that, um, I, I'm authentic and I'm honest and what you see is what you get with me. And I'm the same person at church as I am at home. And I'm the same person at home as I am on the street. And if I'm having a bad day, I tell you. And if I'm having a good day, I tell you. And you always know where you stand with me. And I think that's that can be a good thing. Some people misconstrue that and say maybe that's not a good thing. But to me, that is. It's probably one of the qualities I love the most about myself because you always know where you stand. And that's what I would expect from other people. I don't like fake. Um, I don't like people who put on a plastic smile, pretend like everything's okay, and then in reality it's not. I want someone to show me the tears and say, life is hard, help me get through it. And for me, that earns my re- my respect for them in my book because they were honest and open enough and vulnerable enough to want to share their, their situation or their story with me. And uh, so that for me is uh, 
my purpose, all of our purposes as Christians is to make disciples, of course, but um, for me especially, I, I want people to say that I challenged them in a way that made them better. Mm. I love that, Michelle. Um, you you are a pastor's wife, and so your life does intersect with many yeah. different kinds of women, healthy, hurting, functional, dysfunctional, um, women who are discouraged, stressed out, lonely, women who are positive and, and overcomers. But Michelle, um, you know, if I had the world's best recipe for chocolate cake, I'd certainly be sharing that with the women in my life. Yes. If I knew how to um, lose 50 pounds and keep it off, honey, you better believe there'd be women knocking at my door yes. to say, Carol, how do you do that? Well, Michelle, what is the one lesson that you feel qualified to teach other women? What, what is the one thing that, that you know that has been birthed in you that you think, yes, I can share this with the women under my watch. Yes, I've been through the journey. I've, I've walked through the hard stuff. And now I can teach this to the women that God gives to me. I think, I think for me, in just this journey that I've been on over the past uh, two years, I've learned a ton about surrender. And I've learned that there is freedom in surrender. And I think that's actually something that I could teach on now. Now, that's a, a topic that had been, God had been birthing in me for years prior to that. And I'd been pitching it at writer's conferences and it was going nowhere. And so I kind of left it on my desktop and thought, okay, I must have gotten it wrong and I'll wait on God. And if I have to self-publish, that's okay. And it wasn't until right before COVID that I really realized what surrender meant. And it was actually through the backdrop of my struggle with uh, generalized anxiety disorder and through um, high bouts of anxiety that I was experiencing right before COVID really was making its impact. And so I could teach probably on either how to surrender, which I don't know if I'll ever get to fully surrender in this side of heaven, if I'm honest, but at the same time, I probably could teach them how to take the next steps towards surrender. And I think I can also teach about anxiety and how it's okay not to be okay and how to live with anxiety, have coping strategies to uh, manage anxiety, and then how to help the church help others with anxiety deal with that, with that issue. Well, before we rejoin my conversation with Michelle, I wanted to invite you my listeners and my friends, to the 18th annual Carol McLeod Ministries Conference, which is going to be held at Life Church, Buffalo, New York, on March 25th and 26th. Now, before you say, Carol, I don't live near Buffalo, that's okay. We have you covered because you can either attend in person and enjoy the worship and the marketplace and the prayer and the friendship, or you can join us virtually. We will be offering a virtual option to women who live all around the world. You can learn more about this conference by going to my website, which is carolmcleodministries.com. And now let's get back to the topic of surrender with Michelle Lazurek. Because you are a writer, um, actually an award-winning author, which is so cool. I'm so proud of you. But you have a new book out that you've alluded to, but that's where I want to go now. And the title of the book, I love the title, I Surrender All, Sort Of. <laughs> um, and then the subtitle, Laying Down Our Plans So God Can Do the Impossible. Th this is a wow book for women, I think, especially at the first part of the 21st century, um, because our lives often do not turn out the way we pictured them when we were little girls. So we're, we're surrender surrendering lifelong dreams, right? Yeah. We're, we're surrendering future plans. Um, we're surrendering our hearts. So what caused you to write this book? to this generation of women? I know you've sort of talked about it, but go into it more deeply. Yeah. Um, I knew as I was going through it that God was going to make me write about it <laughs> because it was, I've never written a book that I haven't personally experienced. And this has been no exception. 
And when you are in a state of panic all the time, which is where I had gotten to with my struggle with anxiety, um, there is no control to be had in life. Pretty much everything in your life gets touched or impacted by your anxiety. And so when I was getting to that point, um, it was impacting everything and everyone around me. Um, my kids were affected. My husband was affected. Our church was affected. I had to take a leave of absence. Well, you can't be a pastor's wife and just deal with those things privately. Like You have to let the church know. So announcements had to be made. And so um, there's, an, there's enough embarrassment and shame in that alone to have to process with the Lord about. And COVID was a gift in that I had that struggle with anxiety to the point where I had to accept help from professionals, from psychiatrists, get medication, get counseling for all of those things. And then when I had started to get things under control, COVID hit and everything shut down. So I didn't see people for many, many months before everything kind of opened back up. So in a sense for someone like me, who's a kind of a quiet, shy introvert, that was a gift because I was able to process through all of those the lies that I was believing and the false beliefs and all those things that were going through and the shame and the embarrassment of having anxiety before I ever needed to see people face to face. And so for me, that was a huge, um, it was, it was a huge gift uh, from God uh, for me to be able to have that. Um, and so uh, I use the backdrop of, of anxiety in my bout with that because that's what helped me learn how to surrender. And there is a paradox. There's actually a paradox as I was studying uh, about surrender to the concept, which is I always thought it was just kind of just lay back and you can't, you know, just kind of lace your fingers in between and you just wait on God and he just does everything. And there are times when God asks you to do that for sure. But there are other times when God points out to us that we're doing a lot of good things, but we're not doing the right things Mm -hmm. and we're not doing the right things for his purpose. And so when you ask me about my life purpose, I want to be always be strategic about what I'm working on or working towards and why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because there's a lot of great things that I could be filling my time with. I mean, I could be on podcasts every day if I wanted to be. I could be on, you know, writing articles and making myself busy to put on this false self that I'm this great important person when the reality is is that this is about God and this is about his message. And I have to be obedient to what I feel God's calling me to do um, in this season of life. And I knew that was what he was going to call me to do was to write about this tough season where I really was struggling with with anxiety and taking medication and getting things under control and asking for help. And so he was asking me about the areas of my life that I really had never given over to him fully. So it could be things like my kids, my husband, my finances, my health, my health, um, you know, anything that... uh, God was starting to reveal. And so that's why I wanted to write the book the way I did. And the anchor verse for the book is in Exodus 14. And it's when the Israelites are surrounded, they see that swarm of armies, they're outnumbered. They start complaining to Moses, we're going to die. We didn't want to be here. Why did you send us here? And Moses says, stand firm and watch what the Lord's going to do. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. And it's actually when they lay down their weapons that God does this miraculous stuff all throughout the rest of the text. It's pretty amazing to see that it's only when they laid things down did God work on their behalf. If they had continued to wield their swords, would God have done the things that he had done? And my estimation is probably not because he will never force himself on, on us. He allows us that choice. And so when they chose to lay down their weapons, which is so counterintuitive anyway, like who in, who in today's society would choose to actually lay down the things that are going to help keep them safe and the things that they can control? When the reality is when they laid them down, that's when God worked on their behalf. And so that's what I want to help people understand is that the things that we're actually holding on to are the things that God's really asking us to let go. And when we can actually give him and put our hands like this and give him everything that we already have in the full knowledge that's already his anyway, and know that God is in control and allow him full control and access of our lives, that's when God does the impossible in our lives. And I understood that through that bout with anxiety. Um, And I do still have bouts from time to time. And I have the coping strategies now that I didn't have before. Um, But I had to humble myself and ask for help. And I had to, you know, let my, my church, you know, help me. And that, for me, that was probably one of the biggest uh, areas that I saw that the God shine through was my church. I thought they would be more judgmental than they were. I thought they would be a less understanding than they were, but people would just flooded me with cards and gifts and flowers and encouraging words. 
and the stories, Carol, of how many people I had, we had at least 10, 15, 20 people come up to me and either say they had personally experienced a mental health issue in their lives or they knew a loved one and they watched and experienced it firsthand, a mental health issue. And so for me, part of my ultimate purpose in writing the book was, of course, getting my story out and letting people find wholeness and healing through that story. But also, I would love to see mental health less stigmatized and more normalized within the church because so many people are struggling with illnesses and they don't tell anyone. And that's really where Satan can really get that foothold is when we're isolated and when we're alone and we don't share those things. And we really do need the body of Christ, the body of believers around us to help us get through those times. And whether it's encouraging us and and clapping our hands or it's a struggle and they're praying for us or they're being the tangible uh, hands and feet of Christ, whatever that might be, that's really where the church shines. And it's where the church shined in my life during that tough season. So, um, you know, if if you're out there listening and you don't have a local church body, I always encourage people to find a place where you can connect because I don't know how people do it. I don't know how people do it without God anyway. But if you if you do have God and you're totally isolated and you and you're relying on your computer screen or your TV for a preacher and you're not connected to that local the brothers and sisters of Christ, you're missing out on a major component of doing the Christian life together and allowing yourself to really grow. Um, in him and through him, through that local church body. So, Amen. Amen. Um, you know, one thing I love about you, Michelle, is I have a saying in life, don't waste your pain, because we all have pain. Yeah. But what you have done is used it as a springboard to minister to other people and how powerful that is. Okay, so f- just for the next couple minutes, because our time is going way too fast, we might need to do this again, Michelle. I'm going to tell you the things that I have a hard time surrendering, and I want you to coach me on a practical level. Like, give me the one, two, three of Carol. If you could do this, this, and this, it would really help okay. you. Okay. Yeah. I have a hard time surrendering my adult kids. I have a hard time surrendering my finances. And I have a hard time surrendering um, my ministry, my passion, my my drive to encourage a generation of women. Like I, I own that. So sort of coach me. Just give me a one, two, three, Carol, this is what you need to surrender and how you do it. I, You know, it's funny that you're asking me that, Carol, because if I remember right, when you came to speak to us a few years ago, you coached us on how to have more joy. And you shared your own story of your struggle with with depression and how you found hope through clinging to scripture and prayer. And so that's what I probably would start with when I, if I was to coach you, I would say the exact same things. Like you really threw out any other distraction from your life besides the word of God. And you flooded your ears with, with Uh, spiritual music and you read, you clung to the word of God and you prayed. And I think, you know, reading the word in prayer are such important components of the Christian walk, but they're the very basic components. I would never say to someone not, not to do those things because they're wonderful. But when's the last time did we ever really get down on our knees and just bawl our eyes out in front of no one but the Lord Mm -hmm. and really cry out? I think some of the most important and most significant prayers we've ever prayed are one word prayers like help, or just thanking, asking God for um, for His guidance, thanking Him for all He's done. Sometimes I'll start off in quiet time, and all I can say for ten minutes is just just the qualities of who He is, because that's these are some of the things that I've learned. And I think we cannot we cannot teach anyone else to do something we've never experienced. If we haven't lived it out, and it's not near and dear to our hearts, we're never going to cling on to it to want to be motivated to teach others like you are, Carol. So I think your close relationship with the Lord is is so vital. And that's what I would say to anybody too, is that reading the word in prayer is wonderful. But if we're so busy talking to God and not listening for him, and there's so many spiritual disciplines that we neglect, uh, when's the last time we sat in silence or in solitude, just by mm-hmm. ourselves mm-hmm. for, for mm-hmm. no other reason than just to be in his presence? Like mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. alone can be so, it, it can help uh, cure anxiety, by the way. Um, I know there are, I know some um, teachers and professors that struggle with anxiety themselves. And they say, when I sit for 20 minutes just in the presence of God and I'm by myself and I'm all alone and there's no media distracting me, there's nothing distracting me, right after the 20, 20, 25 minutes, my soul will start to settle. And mm-hmm. he says that he mm-hmm. his anxiety will diminish uh, mm-hmm. greatly through that. That's wow. a discipline. That is a gift yeah. from God yeah. that... Yeah. 
yes, yes, we do need medication sometimes. These are chemical imbalances. We live in a broken world. This is not just a get out of your head, just read your word and pray. So I pray that no one he, listening thinks that's what I'm saying because I'm not. But at the same time, that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about living with the purpose and working, doing the right things. Because yes. if we're not spending the time clinging to the word of God, and we're not clinging to his promises. Those words are not penetrating our hearts. And we're just talking at people about God for no other reason than to glorify ourselves rather than to glorify God. And we're not using our testimonies to shine, to help God shine and glorify him. Then what are we doing as mm -hmm. people, as Christians? And, and as we move more towards a post-Christian nation, which we already are, our testimonies are going to be the things that we have to cling to. Yes. And those are the things that you know, if we do face persecution, which the Lord does promise in his word, we will. And so when we have those things, what will we have if we don't have Bibles to read anymore? We'll only have our head and our hearts, and they can't take away those hymns that we sing, and they can't take away the, the prayers that we've prayed, and they can't take away the Word of God that's buried deep within us. And so the time is now. The time is yeah. now to be memorizing Scripture. The time is now to be reading the Word. The time is now to be sitting in His presence, asking Him, Lord, what is the future? And to be honest, we miss out on so many of the miraculous gifts too. You know, Scripture does talk about, you know, hearing from God and allowing him to speak to us. And that's the beauty of having a loving God. It's what, it's what differentiates him from any other God out there. Everyone else prays to a God, but we get to speak to a God who speaks back to us. Yes. It, that alone is a gift and we don't experience it enough. Yes. And so while we live in a world where we can open a Bible freely without fear that someone's going to come in and tell us not to, mm -hmm. um, the time is now to really be utilizing those resources. The time, there's no better time to get the word through yeah. audiobook, through through Bibles. There's still yeah. so many access to Bibles right now. We need to be reading them. Mm -hmm. We need to be trans allowing that to transform ourselves. And we need to get real and honest. We need to be self-aware people that know where our weaknesses are. And we need to be able to confess that to God. We need to be held responsible for our sin. Call it sin. Amen. Call it what it is. Take responsibility for it. Confess that to God, let him heal us, and then allow the body and blood of Christ, which are the hands and feet of him when we walk into that local community, allow us together to partner together so that we can impact the world for Christ. Yeah. Oh, Michelle, I've, I've got like 47 more questions for you <laughs> and our time is up. So I promise we're going to do this again soon. Okay. Thanks. And Thanks. Thank you. But I just want to encourage my friends who are listening, your new book, I Surrender All, Sort Of by Michelle Azarek. I'm so grateful you were here. And Michelle, just before you go, would you quickly pray for the women who are listening? Absolutely. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for a moment of your time, Lord. And I'm just, just sitting in awe of watching a screen with a wonderful woman of God who I have not seen in a few years, but has always been close to my heart, um, that we can connect through technology, even though we're miles and miles apart. And that we can together partner in the gospel message to give hope and healing to people who are struggling. And Lord, I just pray for those that might be listening that maybe are struggling, that want to know more about the concepts of surrender, but they don't know how to get started, or they think it's too hard, or they feel like they're too far gone. Lord, I just pray that you would speak to their hearts, speak quietly to them, um, give them the gentle conviction, the gentle um, encouragement that they need to spur themselves on. Lord, as we spur each other on uh, towards continuing the gospel message. And, uh, and Lord, for those that have struggled with anxiety, uh, Lord, I hope and pray that they would take from this that there is freedom and there is hope. Lord, as long as we have a pulse, as long as we can get out of bed, there is still hope um, for us. Uh, and we, our hope is in you. And um, our hope is in being able to uh, live in such a way that we can um, spend time in an intimate way, get to know you intimately, and then through that, equip others to do the same. So Lord, I just pray that uh, each person listening would take something from this podcast episode, and they would know that you're speaking to their hearts. And Lord, I just pray that if they need someone to connect to you, that they would connect with Carol or myself or whatever they need, if they need more help or resources or just someone to pray with, Lord, I just pray Thank that this Jesus. podcast would be used powerfully in your name to glorify you and you only and that uh, this would spread far and wide. Um, and uh, Lord, know that I feel that the joy of heaven will be of seeing uh, men and women who were impacted by the work we did here on earth that we never got to meet here. And Lord, I thank you for that. And I thank you that 
you are God that reaches far as far as east is from the west. And I pray that this message would spread that way as well. In your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Michelle. We'll do this again soon. Thank you for joining me this week on the Significant Women podcast. If this episode resonated with you in any way, I do hope that you'll share it with your friends, either on social media or maybe just in a text message or in an email. Also, could I just invite you to leave a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on? It helps us so much when our friends leave a review. I want to remind you, my friend, that you were created for uncommon significance. You were created to partner with God, your creator, in demonstrating his character and his strength while you live on planet Earth. When God looks at your life, he sees a woman of grand significance.